Good evening, everyone. <laughs> and it is a little bit exciting now, so I think we should get started. And why don't we begin with the prayer? It falls in mind the fact that we are in the house of the eternal Father and the Holy Blessed Sacrament. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall be in the face of the earth. That is right. O God, who did instruct the hearts of your faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant that by the gift of the same Spirit we may be truly wise, and evermore rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us ask the Blessed Virgin Mary to accompany us tonight with her powerful prayers as we say together. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and in the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady, Queen and Mother of Mercy, Pray for us. Saint Joseph, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, welcome to tonight's Lenten Conference. Um, welcome because probably for many of you this might be a work night or a school night, and there is bad weather threatening. They're saying up until 9 o'clock we might have severe weather. So thank you for coming out this evening. We may God reward you. You know, there are two videos probably most of you have done already. One is a topical outline. And that topical outline is more for myself than you to keep me on track with what we're going to speak about tonight. Because, you know, believe it or not, there is so much to speak about concerning the Lenten season. You know, in one of the Masses for Lent, one of the prayers within the Mass, it's the prayer over the gifts, over the offering. The Church calls this time of Lent a venerable and sacred time. That we are in a venerable and sacred time. And these days of Lent, well, they can pass through our hands so quickly. And so it's a good thing that we take the time to just regroup and uh, consider what Lent is all about where we have been already in our Lenten journey, and what we are looking forward to. So before we get into this evening's talk, I just want to anchor ourselves in the Word of God, and specifically from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians in chapter 9. And this is what St. Paul says. He says, Do you not know that the runners in the stadium all run in the race, but only one runs to win the prize? Run so as to win. Every athlete exercises discipline in every way. They do it to win a perishable crown, but we are in Thus, I do not run aimlessly. I do not fight as if I were shadow boxing. No, I drive my body and train it for fear that, after having preached to others, I myself should be disqualified. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So, St. Paul. He compares the Christian life, the everyday Christian life, to a race, that you and I have been placed in a race by virtue of our baptism. And the prize that we're looking forward to is nothing less than everlasting life. And he tells you and I to run so we can win. And you know, that's the Christian life in general. Our life, our day in, day in, day out life of being a Christian is a race. 
But we could also say this, that our Lenten journey, the season of Lent, is like the little microcosm of our entire Christian life. That what we should be doing all the time as Christians, no matter what liturgical season we're talking about, what we are expected to do in this race is to pray and to fast and to give alms. That's supposed to be a way of life for us Christians. But what we do now in plan is that we intensify, you could say, what we really should be doing every day of our life, in some way, practicing mercy towards others, in some way, fasting or mortification or self-denial in some way, and obviously also prayer. That's a way of life for us, and we intensify that now during this season of Lent. So Paul compares the Christian life to a race. And if you think about it, a runner in a race, perhaps as he's entering the last lap of the race, what does he often do? The one who's in the forefront, he'll take the time for the last lap to look back, in just a moment, to see how much distance there is between himself and the closest runner. Then what he might do is just slow down a little bit and take a deep breath. And after that deep breath, he's going to sprint to the finish line, to the prize. You know, that's what you could say this coming Sunday is all about. You could say this coming Sunday, the entire Sunday, it's a very special Sunday nestled within the Lenten season. You could say on the Twilight Sunday, the church is saying, you know what, you and I, we can have a little respite from the Lenten race, the Lenten journey. We can catch our breath, so to speak, so that we can spread and spring to the prize, which is holy week. The Easter trigger, the Easter season, which brings us into everlasting life. So this Sunday, it's called the Tari Sunday, the fourth Sunday of, of Lent. And why is it called the Tari Sunday? Simply because the entrance antiphon, the first two words of the Mass are Letare Jerusalem, rejoice, Jerusalem, be happy on this Sunday. And, and why is the church rejoicing this coming Sunday? You know what? Tomorrow, Thursday, is precisely the midpoint of our Lenten journey, our Lenten race. And so this Sunday, we will have passed the midpoint of Lent. And so now we can see the end of our fasting is, is in sight. And now we can have a sense of real deep anticipation to celebrate the Easter mysteries during Holy Week and, and during the Trinity. And so on this coming Sunday, late Friday Sunday, the Church says, within the celebration of the Mass, our music can be a little more festive, you know, during the Lenten season, instruments in the organ, they're only supposed to be used to perhaps support our singing, but not to embellish. But this Sunday, it can be a little more festive. Then the church says, you can even adorn the, the altar with flowers just for this Sunday. And then, the church, well, she changes her liturgical song, colors just for this Sunday. And what is the liturgical color? It's rose. It's not pink. It's not baby rattle, baby rattle pink. It's, it's rose. That's the liturgical color. Why does she do that? What's the meaning? 
You might remember some of us who are old enough. Um, do you remember back in the day when you went to dye Easter eggs? The most famous kind of dye was called the Paz Easter egg dye, where you would put little tablets in cups of vinegar and the color would dissolve. And sometimes kids would take one egg and dip it in one color and then dip it in another color to come up with a unique color. You could say the church, she has mixed her liturgical colors just for this Sunday. It's as if she has mixed the violet of Lent, the color of pennies, along with the white and gold of the Easter season. Mix those two together and come up with rose. Now, scientifically speaking, that is not correct when you look at the color spectrum. But you get the idea. She's mixed the idea of Lent with Easter. And so this Sunday, we have a reserved anticipation for what we're about to enter into. Because on Monday, we have to get back into the race of Lent. And you know, at this time of Lent, there is a special group in the church who are very, very excited about what's to come. And that's the catechumens. Those are those people who have been studying now, perhaps almost for a year, to celebrate the Easter mysteries and the Easter sacraments at the Easter vigil. And so they're looking forward to the celebration of baptism, confirmation, and their first Holy Communion with great anticipation. Like this week, this third week of Lent, they will be handed, the Catechumens, they will be handed in a ceremony on a beautiful parchment paper, the Creed. In other words, they are accepting the Christian faith in its totality. And then next week, the catechumens will receive perhaps some beautiful parchment paper, the Our Father prayer. In other words, they are accepting in all its totality Christian prayer. And these weeks right now, the third, the fourth, and the fifth week of, of Lent, there are special prayers for these people to support them in their struggles to enter into the church. And they're anointed with the oil of the catechumens to, to give them strength in their journey, their final last days, into the church. And so the topic, the, the theme for these two talks tonight and tomorrow is in the home stretch of Lent, glancing back and looking forward in the light of the Tari Sunday, in the light of this coming Sunday. And so we're going to look back a little bit, and then tomorrow night, if you come, we'll look forward to the end of Lent and to the celebration of the Easter Mysteries. Where I would like to begin is the prayer over the palms that you will hear prayed on Palm Sunday morning. It was a special prayer. It's prayed over the palm branches. There's something very unique about this prayer. You know, this coming Palm Sunday will be my 22nd time of having to say this prayer. I've been a priest now for 22 years. And over the years, I realized in myself that this prayer of blessing makes me feel, when I have to say it before the people of God, it makes me feel uncomfortable. And perhaps maybe you'll know as I read the prayer. So, the palms of breath blessed with this prayer. Dear brothers and sisters, since the beginning of Lent until now, we have prepared our hearts by penance and charitable work. Today, Palm Sunday, we gather together to herald with the whole church the beginning of the celebration of our Lord's 
Paschal mystery, that is to say, of his passion and resurrection. So that line here, since the beginning of Lent until now, we have prepared our hearts by penance and charitable work. I often think to myself when I have to read that lesson, did I prepare myself? Did I prepare myself as best as I could by penance and charitable work? And so through the course of the years, this prayer has stayed in my mind and it has kind of been a motivation for me to do the best I possibly can to keep a good Lent because on Palm Sunday morning, I don't want to feel down on the doubles when I read that prayer. So it's been a source of motiv motivation for me. So now let's look back now. We're in this race and let's see where we have been. Like a runner looks back. And let's look back to the very first day of Lent, Ash Wednesday. Because it was within the Mass of Ash Wednesday where you and I were given the program for these six weeks. We were told on Ash Wednesday how we are to observe these days. We were told what we will do in observance and in what kind of spirit will we keep these days. So you might remember on Ash Wednesday, the Gospel was about our Lord speaking to the crowd about fasting, about almsgiving, and about prayer. The Lord said, when you pray, when you fast, and when you give alms. In other words, doesn't it seem like the Lord is saying, I expect you to do these things that these should be a way of life for my followers when you pray, when you fast, and when you give alms. But then he told us in what kind of spirit we should do those three things. He said, when you fast, wash your face so that no one can perceive that you are fasting. Because he says, if you fast in such a way that others are going to take notice, that's your reward. The praise of your fellow man, they're praising you because you're fasting. But you lose the reward that the Eternal Father is holding out for you, who sees your fasting in secret. He says when you pray, go into your inner room and lock the door. And your father, who is in secret, will take notice of your prayer. Then he says, when you give alms, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Otherwise, if you receive praise from your fellow man, your fellow woman, then you bypass the reward that the eternal father is holding out for you. So on Ash Wednesday morning, we were told to pray, fast, and be moms in such a way that it is noticed by our Heavenly Father. Then you might remember on Ash Wednesday morning, it's about three, three and a half weeks ago now, but on Ash Wednesday morning, the, the first reading was from the prophet Joel. And a very poignant image was placed before us. God told his people through the prophet Joel, Rend your hearts, not your garments. What was he saying? Rend your hearts and not your garments. Well, you know, the Jewish people, whenever they felt something very deep inside themselves, perhaps sorrow over their own sinfulness and infidelity, or perhaps when they heard the, the Lord's name last what did they do? In a very dramatic way, they stood up in front of everybody and they ripped their tunics from the neck down. 
And the prophet Job is saying, the Lord doesn't want you to rip your tunics. He wants you to rip your hearts. To rip your hearts. It's as if the Lord is saying to the Israelites and to you and I, you know, I've had enough of the drama. I want serious, heartfelt conversion. You don't have to rip your tunic to impress me. What I would like you to do, my people, I would like you to rip open your hearts and lay them there before me so that they can be under my gaze and I can heal you. So that's what we heard on Ash Wednesday. So we are to pray, fast, and give alms in such a way that it's matched up with our interior life, not just outward. And then the second reading on Ash Wednesday, we heard from St. Paul in his first letter to the Corinthians. And Paul said this, now is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. It's as if the church is saying to us on Ash Wednesday, we have to have a sense of urgency about what we are to do during this Lenten season. Because we can't put our, our conversion off another day. This might be the last Lenten season that God gives me or gives you. And every single day of Lent is an unrepeatable day of grace. And we don't want to lose a single day. So that was the program. As we look back to Ash Wednesday, that was the program. We pray, fast, and give alms with an interior spirit and with a sense of urgency. And on that day, there was a special prayer that was prayed over the people at the end of Mass. Let me see if I can find it here. Yes, this is the prayer that was prayed over us as just before leaving the church. Lord, pour out the spirit of compunction on those who bow before your majesty. We ask God to pour out upon us a spirit of compunction on Ash Wednesday. The word compunction, a word we don't hear too much in the English language, but what does compunction mean? I guess the best way to describe it is a visual. If we had a balloon that was inflated in one hand, an inflated balloon, and then a pin right here. And you bring the two together. And the balloon is deflated. That's the spirit of compunction that our pride-filled hearts be deflated. Compunction. That's what we're praying for throughout the season of Lent. And you know, just as on that first day of Lent, on Ash Wednesday, there was a prayer said over the people, every single Lenten Mass has a special prayer to be said over the people. It's not a blessing of prayer, but it's a prayer invoking a special grace upon God's people that they may persevere through this Lenten journey. So you might be hearing throughout this Lenten season, you know, bow your heads. Pray for God's blessing and a special prayer over the people. And so that was the program that we started out with. Now, why don't we take a time now to glance back even, even farther than Ash Wednesday, to glance all the way back to the beginning days of the church and to see how the church was observing then in her first few centuries. And it's very interesting how the church observed these Lenten days. So, you know, there is a, a, a holy father in the history of the church, Pope St. Leo the Great. Pope St. Leo the Great, 
He died in the year 461, so rather early in the history of Christianity. And Pope St. Leo the Great, he said that our Lenten fast, he said that it is of apostolic origin. In other words, that what we're doing during this Lenten season in some way was passed down to us from the first generation of the church, either from the apostles themselves or that first generation who knew the apostles, that we have received this tradition of Lent. It certainly is not something that came to us in the Middle Ages, but it's something very, very early in the life of the church. And so, what's very intriguing when you look back to the early days of the church and how the members of the church were keeping Lent, we notice that there were three groups of people in the church who were all doing the same thing, but for different reasons. These three groups in the church, we could call them the catechumens, those who were prepared to come into the church at the Easter ritual, the penitents, those who needed to be reconciled with the church, and the faithful, those who had been faithful to their baptism of vows. And these three different groups, well, they were all doing the same thing throughout the course of Lent. They were all praying, and they were all fasting, and they were all performing works of mercy, alms giving. But they were doing it for different reasons. So the catechumens, why were they praying, and why were they fasting, and why were they giving alms during the Lenten season? Well, they were doing those things to prepare themselves to enter into the church at the Easter Vigil, to be baptized, to be confirmed, and to receive our Lord in the Eucharist for the very first time. To pray, fasting, and almsgiving, to celebrate the Easter mysteries. But you know, they were doing it in a very rigorous way. Their fasting was rather rigorous. How do we know that? Well, we know that in the early days of the church, for the catechumens at the Easter Vigil, there was a special drink awaiting them for them to consume. So after the catechumens received the sacraments, baptized, confirmed, and received the First Communion, they would be given a very interesting kind of drink. It was a mixture, perhaps, of milk and of honey and of wine. Mm -hmm. And they would drink that down. And that was like a, a very quick protein and sugar rush because they had been fasting in a rather rigorous way. So that drink was set aside for them. And you know, their preparation to come into the church lasted quite a long time. Perhaps two years. The church was very severe with the catechumens. Why? Because she wanted to make sure that the catechumens are going to persevere under persecution. Because you know, it was quite possible that once they came into the church and made the baptismal profession, maybe a couple days after that. There would be a knock at their door, could have been a Roman soldier, and then the Roman soldier might have said, you know, I heard you became a Christian the other day. Could you do me a favor? Could you come down with me to the Temple of Jupiter, Jupiter and just put a little incense on his altar for me? And if you do that, everything will be fine. Well, the early Christians, they didn't want to do that. So they had to be, they had to be firmly resolved that once they entered into the church, they could suffer persecution and even martyrdom. So the catechumens, they were praying, fasting, and giving alms to be brought into the church. Also, there was another group of Christians.
Christians and they were called penitents. And they would pray and cast them and give them alms for another reason. See, these were people who had in some way committed a rather serious, serious sin. But not only was it a serious sin, but it was also publicly known. And so perhaps it caused some sort of scandal. So the church said with this group, well, because you wounded, you wounded the church through this scandal, we would ask you to do some public penance before you receive the sacrament of reconciliation. So what the penitents did was, on Ash Wednesday morning, they came to the house of, of their bishop, and they would come, and the bishop would pray over them, and dress them in penitential garb, sackcloth, and then he would say to the penitents, go and do penance, and that's what they would do. And then on Holy Thursday morning, at the end of the Lenten season, they would come back to the bishop's residence, and the bishop would celebrate them with them, the sacrament of penance, so that they could be reconciled with God and the church and be able to join everybody else on Thursday night for the Mass of the Lord's Supper. So they were praying and fasting and giving alms to be reconciled with the church. And you know, there's one interesting detail that I forgot. On Ash Wednesday, when the penitents came to the bishop's residence, what he would do is after they were, you know, dressed in penitential garb, he would take a handful of ashes and then over that head to the penitents, just disperse the ashes. And you know, that's where we get our tradition on Ash Wednesday of being marked the ashes. So the penitents were praying, fasting, and giving alms. Then, the last group of people in the early days of the church, who were praying, fasting, and almsgiving during the Lent, would be the faithful. Those who have been faithful to the baptism of the house. But why would they pray and fast and give the alms? Because, at the Easter vigil, they were going to publicly renew their baptism of the house. And so, they wanted to be well prepared for that moment. And you know, that's what you and I will do. Either at the Easter Vigil or Easter Sunday morning Mass, that will publicly renew our baptism of that. So you and I are praying and fasting and giving alms so that we can be prepared for that very important moment. And you know, that is a very important moment because you know the church, she attaches a plenary indulgence to that public profession of our baptismal vows, either at the Easter vigil or Easter Sunday morning. That's how important that moment is. And so we want to be well prepared to renew our baptismal commitment at Easter time. Then, let's just take a glance back to just two generations ago, maybe our great-grandparents, and how they were observing Lent. And if we were to look at their Lenten days, it would be very different from the way our Lent looks today. So just two generations ago, maybe our great-grandparents, how were they observing these these sacred days, this venerable time. Well, for them, every day of Lent, except Sundays, was a fast day. Every single day, except Sundays. So that means that, that our great grandparents, they were having one full meal every single day, and maybe two little snacks, two light relations that did not add up to a meal. And what's amazing about this is, you know, our great grandparents, they were very hard workers. Perhaps they were working manual work, 
in the farmhouse or in the factories, and they were still observing this kind of plenty discipline with their families. What an amazing generation, those generations that run before us. For me, I find that very inspiring. You know, I think today we've become just a little, a little soft in our penitential practices, in our gratification. We should look back to our great grandparents and be inspired by them. Also, for them, our great grandparents, weekdays were partial days of abstinence, not just Fridays, but all the other weekdays. So that means that every single day, they could perhaps have meat at just one meal. Weekdays were partial days of abstinence. So every weekday was a full day of fast, and every weekday was partial abstinence. So that's how our great grandparents were observing this sacred season. So as we look back to what Ash Wednesday called us to, and as we look back to the early days of the church, and as we look back to just two generations, it should inspire us. And you know, if we feel right now that you know, I haven't been faithful to just about every Lenten commitment I made. Or maybe even I feel like, you know what, I never even got started. I never got started in this Lenten race. It's okay. It's over and done. Remember what the risen Christ said in the book of Revelation. Behold, I make all things new. Jesus is always giving us a new opportunity to get back into the race. So what's done is done. Now we just need to regroup and perhaps do some of the following things. So what would be some suggestions for um, keeping the remaining days of Lent? I think the first thing would be this, is Let's all prepare to make a good confession, a, a, a good integrity confession, to take the time to examine our conscience and, and to examine well on a more deeper level that, that we're accustomed to. And we can examine our conscience against the, the Ten Commandments, against the Seven Capital Sins, against the Beatitudes, the precepts of the Church. All of those things help us to go more deeply in our examining. And you know, when it does come to confession, sometimes we, we can forget that if my conscience convicts me of, of any serious or mortal sin, that that needs to be presented in the confessional in a specific way. When it comes to serious or mortal sin, I simply need to name the sin, the kind, what is it? And I need to name the frequency of that sin. Sometimes we forget that we need to name the frequency. So what is it? Label it, that's all what it is. And then how often? That's only necessary for serious mortal sin. Another thing that we can do for these remaining weeks of Lent is take the time to prayerfully read the passionate accounts of our Lord in, in the various Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. Now, why do I mention that? Because meditation on the passion of our Lord, reading the scripture account, of the passion of our Lord, it can do a couple of things for us. First of all, it can cause us to grow in deeper love for Christ, for what He's done for us. I think it was St. Augustine who said, there's nothing better than meditating on the passion of Christ 
if we want to grow in deeper love for others. Another reason why it's good to meditate on the passion of Christ is because the passion of Christ causes us to realize how costly, what a price our salvation was. It was the spilling of the precious blood of God made man so that you and I could go free. We could be redeemed. That's the cost of our freedom. And then when we read or meditate upon the passion of Jesus, it causes us to begin to realize in a more deep, deeper way the horror of sin. Look what sin has done to God, made man. That, that's a good thing to meditate on. Another thing that we can do in these remaining days of Lent is to practice the corporal and spiritual works of mercy. And you know, we're also getting ready to celebrate Divine Mercy Sunday, the active day of Easter. I remember the tremendous um, promise that the Lord made to Faustina concerning the Divine Mercy Sunday. He said on that day, the very floodgates of His mercy are open on that day, and that no one should despair of God's mercy on that day. That if the sinner would go to confession and then receive our Lord in communion on that day with trust, we would receive a very special grace, a special grace that the Church is still grasping to, to um, explain. He said, the Lord said for that day, we would receive complete forgiveness of sin and complete remission of all temporal punishment that might be remaining. In other words, if you and I were to die on divine mercy someday, we'd go straight to heaven. If we had one confession, received that word of communion, trusting in his mercy. It's almost as if on that day, you and I, just on that day, can have a return to baptismal innocence. On that day, the active day of Easter. And you know, why did the Lord choose the active day of Easter? Well, you know, in the Jewish way of thinking for festivals, the greatest day of the festival is not the first day, it's the last day, the eighth day, the active day. So the Lord Jesus says, on the active of Easter, our sins can be completely forgiven, and all the time of punishment washed away. But there is a caveat with that. Yes, the Lord is so merciful, but He also said to Faustina, but if you want to enjoy my mercy, so to speak, you have to practice mercy towards your brothers and sisters. And so, the corporal and the spiritual works of mercy, which I'll have to speak about in a little bit in a second. And then the last suggestion is simply for these remaining weeks of Lent is to renew or begin. If we have anything begun, we can begin. To renew or begin a plan for prayer, fasting, and honesty. So let's return to this idea of love. The works of mercy is very important. You know, you have a reflection in one of your handouts there is a reflection. It's from St. Peter Chrysologos. And um, St. Peter Chrysologos, he speaks about prayer, fasting, and honesty. And you know what he says? That in the life of a Christian, all three must be present. If you're lacking one, it's not good. He says, if we want the Lord to be propitious to our prayers, He has to see us at prayer, fasting, self-discipline of some sort, and practicing mercy to our brothers and sisters. The three of them go together, prayer, fasting, and honesty. 
They support one another. They feed one another. They infuse one another. So all three things need to be present in our lives. And so, what are the works of mercy? What is mercy in general? Oftentimes when we hear the word mercy, we think it's all about forgiving my brother and sister when they offend me, when they hurt me. And it is that. Mercy is the extension of forgiveness. But it's that and so much more. Mercy is also allowing the Holy Spirit to move my heart to compassion for the suffering that I see in others. Mercy is moving me to come to the aid, the suffering of others, the need of others. And so, mercy has to be practiced in its totality. In other words, we need to express mercy to our brothers and sisters in a physical way. You know the seven corporal works of mercy, you know, to feed the hungry, to give drink to the thirsty, to clothe the naked, to visit the imprisoned, to visit the sick. All those corporal, physical works of mercy. And it's interesting that there are seven works of mercy. That's how we care for, in a merciful way, the body of our brothers and sisters. But it, we can't stop there. We have to care for the spiritual life of our brothers and sisters as well. The spiritual works of mercy. And isn't it interesting that there are seven? Seven physical works of mercy, the cultural works of mercy, seven spiritual works of mercy, seven in the scriptures is a perfect number. It's as if we practice the corporal works of mercy and the spiritual works of mercy, we have perfectly loved our brother and sister. Seven, perfection, totality. That's how we're called to love. Did Jesus say in the Gospel, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect? What is the perfection that he's looking for? The perfection of love. To love as the Father loves us. And so, the spiritual works of mercy. I would dare say that the spiritual works of mercy are more difficult to practice than the corporal works of mercy. You know, if you might remember in the Gospel the, the story of the rich man and Lazarus. Remember the rich man, the Gospel tells us, he was dying sumptuously after he died and he was clothed in purple. You know, rich garments. And at his poor was the poor man, Lazarus. He was hungry and he was poorly clad. How do we know he was poorly clad? Because the gospel says that the dogs even used to come and lick his sores. So he was hungry and poorly clothed. Exactly. The rich man's poor. Now think about the rich man. There at his table, okay? He did not have to exert too much energy to help poor Lazarus. He could have said to his servant, you know what? He didn't even have to get up from his table. He could have said to his servant, you know, could you go into my wardrobe and get an extra cloak and take out some of the man? Or Lazarus himself could have just picked up a lamb chop from his plate, just throw it to the door and give it to Lazarus. Notice the opportunities that God gave the rich man to help Lazarus every single day. And the proximity, he's right there at his door. 
God made it so easy for the rich man to help Lazarus. You know, some of the guys have said, God, our power is found here. God has made it so easy for us to help the poor with our own soup kitchen here. So convenient and so easy, just right here in our back door. So it's rather easy to, to perform the physical, the corporal works of mercy. But the spiritual works of mercy, I dare say, they're a little different. They're more difficult to practice because it takes something more from the inside of ourselves to practice the spiritual works of mercy. So what do I do? To admonish the sinner, to instruct the ignorant, to counsel the doubtful, to comfort the sorrowful, to bear problems patiently, to forgive all injuries, and to pray for the living and the dead. So the first one, to admonish the sin, how difficult that is, especially if your mom or dad. You know how difficult that is to correct. But you know, it is an act of love to help one realize that they are not walking in the good pleasure of God. That's an act of love to do that. Very difficult to do. It's easier to give some food to somebody than to correct somebody. But it's an act of love. To instruct the ignorant. It's an act of love to help others learn about the faith. To teach them. To be a teacher of the CCD. That's an act of love. To counsel the doubtful. It's an act of love to share your faith experience with someone else. You know, it's difficult for us, depending on our personality, to speak about what God has done for us in our lives. You know, the good things that God has done for us, how He has seen us in many difficult times. When we share our faith experience with others, Sometimes that strengthens their faith and dismisses their doubts. To comfort the sorrow, to comfort any kind of sorrow that somebody is suffering with. You know, when you think about when somebody loses a loved one, everyone is there for them during the first week, my like day, at the funeral, or maybe the first two days. But then, you know, they're often forgotten. Just have to pick up the phone and say, you know, you're still in my thoughts, in my prayers. You know that can go a long way to comfort someone, to bear the wrongs patiently, to accept the consequences of the thoughtfulness, the thoughtlessness of others, just to let it go. That's an act of mercy. And that's not weakness, that's strength, that's meekness. Jesus said it himself, I am meek and humble. That takes great strength. To accept the consequences of others' thoughtlessness or rudeness instead of challenging them. Just let it go. To bear or to forgive to forgive all injuries. To forgive, first of all, so that I can go free. That I'm not held captive by my unforgiveness. But also, when we extend forgiveness, the other person might be inspired and come to faith. The act of forgiveness does a lot for others. To pray for the living and the dead, that's so easy to do. To pray for the dead, perhaps have a mass said for the dead, to have a mass said for a forgotten soul 
in purgatory, or to have a man saved for all the souls in purgatory. That's a spiritual act of mercy for a soul who has been forgotten. To pray for the living, you know, what can help us do that is, is to have a little TV notebook, a notebook of prayer intentions that we're going to offer every day for other people. To write in that notebook, I'm going to pray for this person, I'm going to pray for that person. And keep it in your Bible or, or before your, your home altar. That goes a long way. You know, I just discovered today uh, an amazing story. Um, you, you're probably familiar uh, with the line of food products by the name of Goya. You know, Goya makes those wonderful food products to make Latin, Latin American meals. You know, the jiggle is. See, as Goya is many things that you know. If it's Goya, it's got to be good. You know? Well, anyway, the CEO of Goya, he did something remarkable on behalf of the people of the Ukraine. What he did was this he sent 400,000 pounds of food products to the people of the Ukraine. And he didn't stop there. He also sent 15,000 rosaries to the people of the Ukraine. Notice what he did. He practiced both the spiritual and corporal works of mercy on behalf of these people. How inspiring. So go out and buy something from Goya. It's a great thing. So, that's this evening's conference. It's, it's 8 o'clock in the morning. Tomorrow, if you do come back, what we will do is we'll look forward now. Um, we'll look forward to the finish line of this race. And what is the finish line of this race? It is precisely the Easter mysteries, the Paschal mystery. What is the Paschal mystery? We'll talk about that. We'll talk about the various liturgies during Holy Week. And we'll talk about how we can keep the Easter festivities, the Easter festival, alive for not just Easter Sunday, not just for the Easter Octave, but for the 40 days of Easter. Let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Have a nice evening. Thank you. Thank you.